Hello, and I welcome everybody joining us for the webinar on the post-COVID economic challenges and opportunities in the Caucasus and Central Asia region. My name is Nastasia Straszewska. I am the Moscow and Central Asia correspondent for the Financial Times, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Just a few technical details before we start. We are broadcasting live on Zoom, as well as the IMF website and social media accounts on Twitter and Facebook. We are broadcasting in English, but Russian language translation will be available in Zoom at the bottom of the screen, as well as on the Russian language Facebook uh, page of the IMF. I'll repeat the same in uh, Russian for our Russian speakers. Um, Сессию на русском можно будет посмотреть на странице в Фейсбуке IMF, а также переключить на русский язык внизу в Zoom. For those who are joining us on Zoom, we ask you to please switch your cameras and keep them off and keep your mics off. If you would like to ask questions, use the chat box. For those joining us on other platforms, you can send your questions via social media using hashtag CCA. Now let me introduce the panel of exceptional speakers. I'm honored to lead today. They include Mr. Subir Lal, the IMF's Deputy Director for the Middle East and Central Asia Department, Mrs. Nadia Tornava, Minister of Economy and Sustainable Development of Georgia, Mr. Timur Shmetov, Uzbekistan's Finance Minister, and Mr. Peter Burian, European Union's Special Representative for Central Asia. And with no further ado, since our time is limited, I would like to pass the screen to Mr. Subir Lal. Mr. Lal, you published the original economic outlook three days ago. As we look ahead, what is the economic outlook for the Caucasus and Central Asia region? And can you broadly outline the key challenges facing the countries? Um, thank you, Nastasia. Before addressing your question, allow me to also welcome everyone to this uh, discussion this morning and this evening in, in, in uh, uh, Central Asia. Uh, the launch of our Rio is always an important opportunity for us to engage with the region. And it is particularly important at this juncture given the social and economic challenges facing the region with the impact of the COVID pandemic and the shock still very acute. Uh, we hope this discussion will contribute uh, to the debate around uh, which are the best policies to help address these challenges. And we are really honored to benefit from this, uh, uh, from the participation in this event of our three eminent speakers who have graciously agreed to join us. Um, coming to your question, to help answer it, uh, allow me to present a few slides that summarize what we see as the key challenges ahead in the Caucasus and the Central Asia region, what we call the CCA region, and which of course draw on the analysis um, uh, in the full uh, regional economic outlook, which is uh, available. So if you look at the chart here, the first chart on the left, um, uh, is based on available information so far, and it shows that the vaccination coverage is low in most of the CCA countries. And uh, of course, as we all know, the number of COVID cases is still high and increasing in several uh, of the CCA countries. Uh, the middle chart uh, shows that in terms of vaccine, uh, full vaccine coverage, we have three sets of countries. There are the early inoculators, which in the case of the CCA region is really only Kazakhstan uh, at the moment, which started vaccinations in December and January of uh, 2021, December 2020. But, uh, and most of the countries in that category, which are mostly in the Middle East and North Africa region and not in the CCA as I mentioned, they're expected to uh, complete uh, uh, a significant share of the uh, population's vaccination by the end of this year. Uh, slow inoculators would be those that have started with limited coverage and are not expected to inoculate a significant population until mid-2022. Now, most of the CCA countries fall in the third category, which is the late inoculators. This group is expected to start inoculations only in the second half of this year and will likely experience prolonged uh, rollouts. And given the low capacity for vaccine storage and distribution, late inoculators are not expected to achieve broad vaccine coverage until 2023. And uh, for this latter group, of course, uh, international cooperation at a stepped up level will be key to support them. 
including through the delivery of vaccine doses this year under the COVAX plan. Now, at the third chart here um, shows that um, based on our projections, early access to vaccines is expected to support near-term growth. And that should not be surprising because as a greater share of the population is inoculated, uh, uh, economic activity uh, can, can resume uh, more quickly uh, at a stepped up pace for these countries. And relative to the October uh, Rio, um, the 2021 growth projections have been revised up for early inoculators, but uh, the late inoculators uh, are not going to benefit from that at the moment. Moving to the next set of uh, uh, slides, uh, you can look at, uh, you can see the projections here that uh, one of the other factors that had a big influence was fiscal support um, that was deployed uh, when the pandemic hit last year. And on the left side chart, you see that countries that deployed above average fiscal support uh, are expected to have a faster recovery, which is the yellow dashed line. And countries that provided below average support will not see a return to pre-pandemic uh, GDP levels until later. Now, uh, a second factor that matters in terms of uh, timing the recovery is uh, the dependence on tourism, which of course is uh, a contact intensive sector that was hit particularly hard by the pandemic. The outlook for countries uh, that are uh, dependent on tourism heavily will continue to be influenced by restrictions placed both domestically and on international travel, and also hesitation about inbound tourism and uh, voluntary or mandated social distancing measures. And our growth projections for countries that rely on tourism revenues were revised down significantly relative to the October regional economic outlook. The last chart here on the right-hand side uh, shows that uh, several countries in the region are also heavily uh, dependent on remittances and mainly from Russia. Uh, while there was a sharp drop in remittances early um, when the pandemic struck in the first half of 2020, they did quickly turn around in the third quarter and ended the year uh, more strong than was initially expected, especially around the oil importers. This illustrates the stabilizing role that remittances can play after a shock. And uh, this is crucial and it can serve as a lifeline for uh, the poorest uh, uh, countries. Now, moving to the next slide, uh, of course, um, it's not a surprise um, that uh, there is an exceptional uncertainty around the outlook. You know, um, dealing with the pandemic and uh, overcoming the health uh, crisis is going to be important in terms of shaping the outlook. And so new infections and the extent to which vaccines are rolled out will be um, important in determining how quickly the recovery can take hold. And of course, if vaccine production is uh, expanded and distributed faster than expected, the recovery would be faster. While it could be protracted if there are a new infections, new variants, or there is a delay uh, around the baseline of when we expect vaccinations to be um, rolled out. There are other factors as well that cloud uh, the outlook, and this includes tighter financial conditions, possibly a premature withdrawal of policy support, which we don't expect, but uh, it's a risk to the outlook. And of course, a medium term concern is that an unequal recovery could lead to an increase in uh, poverty and inequality. Uh, uh, and, and that's uh, something also that is um, something that weighs in the, on the outlook. Uh, the middle uh, chart and, and the last one on this uh, slide show that um, there are risks related to tighter external funding conditions for the CCA countries. And these are increasingly material. Uh, the recent increase in the US uh, long-term bond yields uh, have led to renewed capital outflows very recently from the region. And that's the blue line, which is the outflows. And uh, the red line is the bond yield uh, in the middle uh, chart. This is raising concerns about some of the more vulnerable emerging market countries and uh, including in countries where external debt is elevated and or has increased significantly uh, in recent years. However, that several of these countries actually rely uh, 
a higher, uh, on higher official borrowing and would be less subject to any tightening in market conditions. Um, and some of them have uh, ample reserve buffers as well uh, to contain uh, any uh, challenges from the sharpening uh, financial conditions. And finally, uh, in the last set of um, charts, uh, this is a summary of, of the projections. And uh, the left-hand side chart, you can see that um, projections vary across the region, of course, uh, and uh, we're um, uh, and uh, they, on average, they remain below that of the emerging market and developing economies group as a whole. Uh, real GDP growth is expected to pick up uh, this year to 3.7% in uh, 2021. It's a marginal downgrade relative to our October uh, projection. Uh, while uh, oil exporters should uh, grow at about the same pace as projected in October, which is in fact also around 3.7%, um, there are significant uh, downgrades for oil importers. Um, and uh, on balance though, uh, there was a, I mean, a 2.1 percentage point a reduction in the uh, forecast for oil importers for this year. Uh, and uh, in a number of countries, growth has been marked down. For example, uh, in the case of uh, Georgia and the Kyrgyz Republic due to the second wave of the pandemic and continued weakness uh, in, in tourism. Uh, on the other hand, for oil exporters, um, the oil production cuts under OPEC plus might uh, affect activity in Azerbaijan, uh, and but Kazakhstan might be able to increase uh, oil production and Uzbekistan would benefit from a rebound in mining, transportation, and the uh, hospitality sectors. Uh, and finally, uh, the second chart is an important one to keep in mind, and that is that uh, the pandemic could have a lasting impact on the region. And this shows how much GDP might be lower in 2024, about three years from now, relative to what was projected before the pandemic struck. And it shows that uh, this loss in GDP might be uh, close to what's the average for emerging market and developing uh, economies. And uh, of course, uh, this reflects to some extent the impact on the outlook that countries will face, for instance, who depend on tourism and who will have subdued tourism for an extended period of time. But there are also country-specific uh, factors you know, at play. Uh, Nastasia, let me stop here. And I think we are, um, this is probably a, a very uh, brief, but uh, more or less comprehensive uh, summary of our outlook uh, for this reel. Thank you. Mm, no, this is excellent, Sabir. Um, let's talk a little bit about the recovery paths and regional challenges with the ministers. And I'd like to start with Natia Turnava. Uh, Mrs. Ternava, given the challenges facing the Caucasus and Central Asian countries during the COVID recovery phase, in which areas can the funds policy advice and technical assistance most usefully support the region, do you think? Uh, thank you, Nastasia. Uh, dear Deputy Director, dear IMF uh, colleagues, uh, first of all, uh, let me express my gratitude towards IMF team for inviting me to this very uh, interesting and important yet online gathering. Uh, coming back to your uh, question, uh, let me start by saying that COVID-19 outbreak has hit uh, the global economy hard and Middle East and Central Asia countries uh, does not represent any exception. Uh, I would like to mention the importance of joint efforts and uh, policy coordination among regional countries to address such a global challenge in the post-COVID world and to continue the path of regional integration. Uh, as mentioned in regional economic outlook, considering uh, the uncertainty regarding growth projections, uh, the race between vaccine rollouts and uh, the new infections will uh, determine whether the region will have a faster or more uh, protracted uh, recovery in the near term. Uh, the recovery path of uh, Caucasus and Central Asia countries uh, significantly depends on um, our policy actions, of course, uh, targeted measures and uh, tailoring policies to the existing needs and post-pandemic developments. 
Certainly, we need to find right balance between managing virus spread and at the same time, safeguarding economic recovery. And it becomes harder and harder. Uh, we should focus on active labor market policies, first of all. Uh, we should focus on efficiency in the fiscal support, uh, human capital development, and the green recovery. So uh, we should not sacrifice the green, green uh, policies to the speedy recovery aims and goals. Uh, we are continuing uh, liquidity support measures to commercial banks and the business sector. And besides, I would like to highlight the importance of uh, supporting economic recovery measures without uh, prejudice to macroeconomic stability and sustainability. We are well aware that fiscal support should be well targeted and support policy should focus on structural transformation. Uh, considering the most significant uh, exposure of tourism sector to the shocks, which is very vital, uh, crucial issue for Georgia, and negative economic growth in Georgia amounted to 6.2% in 2020. Uh, Medium term projections remain, uh, I would say, uh, quite optimistic. According to IMF and the Georgian government projection, after the economic contraction in 2020, uh, econ economy will uh, rebound by 3.5% in 2021 and average medium term growth projection amount to 5.1% in 2021, 2026, supported by infrastructure spending and uh, sustained structural reforms to increase productivity and to enhance private sector led growth. Uh, it is worth to mention that government of Georgia prioritized the structural reforms to address the challenges and uh, focus on long term development goals. Our policy priorities are oriented at structural transformation of the economy, uh, are oriented at the inclusive access to the economic opportunities, to the decrease of external vulnerability, increase of savings and productivity enhancement. Uh, although proactively dealing with the effects of the COVID-19 shock is uh, the near-term priority, we remain committed to continue implementation of the structural reform agenda and uh, focus on long-term development priorities that should ultimately sustain a durable and inclusive recovery. Inclusive recovery are the key words here. Decisive implementation of uh, structural reforms is critical to support the recovery and limit scarring from the COVID-19 shock. Uh, mobilizing investment by developing new investment policy, advancing the new uh, instruments for access to finance, such as securitization, factoring and leasing market development, development of capital market, as well uh, implementing the new insolvency framework, which is very important step for Georgia, uh, large scale mining reform that we launched uh, right before the COVID outbreak, supporting energy security and independence, very important topic. Uh, also, comprehensive SOE reform that we just launched here in Georgia. Uh, all these measures are aimed to support our structural transformation and not just a recovery for recovery. Uh, simultaneously, macroeconomic policy uh, discipline represents the key aspect of our policy priorities. Uh, in parallel with the appropriate support, uh, the recovery, we are laying um, uh, the groundwork for fiscal uh, consolidation as well. We strongly believe that it is vital now more than ever to attract quality FDI to boost economic recovery, to attract outside uh, sources. Uh, despite the pandemic, Georgia remains attractive investment destination. And I would like to point out with a great pleasure that legal business and investment environment due to the reforms conducted by government of Georgia uh, has been uh, highly assessed in international rankings by various international rating institutions uh, during COVID as well. Uh, to this end, we are committed to put special efforts that support building of innovative and eco-efficient economy by improving energy efficiency, adopting green technologies, sustainable resource management, and uh, implementing climate change adaptation measures. Uh, International Monetary Fund is a key partner of our country in the implementation of the prudent macroeconomic policy and structural reforms. Uh, extended fund facility program with IMF can be uh, considered as a success story, an example of solid cooperation. We greatly appreciate the support of IMF, which clearly was confirmed in its assessment and most important part in the cooperation is that uh, our vision and priorities for prudent macroeconomic policy 
coincide. I would like to mention successful uh, completion of the last eighth review of Georgia's economic reform program, supported by a four year extended arrangement under the extended fund facility, EFF. The IMF support and uh, expertise is especially useful in uh, policy implementation, coordination, and decision making process that will help us to ensure efficient and uh, to ensure result oriented and uh, consecutive economic responses and to promote fast economic recovery process. Uh, the recovery will also require strong multilateral cooperation to complement national policy efforts. And we have quite successful experience in the past in the regard with the IMF. Uh, we will continue policy coordination with our development partners to advance, um, to advance our policy measures and to ensure efficient policy making with a great inclusion of all stakeholders and development partners. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say in response to your first question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Minister. Uh, now let's turn to Uzbekistan. Mr. Ishmetov, does any of what Mrs. Turnava just said echo for you? And what do you see as the regional recovery paths and challenges? And where do you see the fund's advice as may be useful in the future? Thank you very much, Nastasia. Well, as uh, colleagues mentioned, this COVID-19 crisis uh, has adversely affected all the countries in the world, of course, uh, our region as well. Uh, given the different stages of economic development uh, and transition to market economy in the countries in our region, I think the policy advice and technical assistance should be should vary from country to country. Uh, first, let me uh, tell what we have learned from this crisis. The first, what we have learned is that fiscal buffers and uh, macroeconomic prudent macroeconomic approach are very important. Those countries who has uh, enough fiscal buffers, uh, low debt, had uh, better room to accommodate this crisis without uh, undermining the overall macroeconomic stability. Uh, since this uh, crisis was a result of the both supply and demand shock, we faced a sharp decline in the revenue, at the same time increase in the expenditure, which led obviously to increase uh, in the debt. Uh, as in many countries, Uzbekistan, of course, uh, uses all the measures. It's including uh, fiscal, monetary, and financial measures against the crisis, and it, it uh, helped to prevent the sharp decline in economic growth in Uzbekistan. We had a positive growth, uh, the small one, 1.6 percent. Uh, but since consolidated uh, budget deficit increased to 4.5 percent of GDP. Uh, our state debt, uh, including external and domestic, uh, increased from 30% to roughly 40% of GDP. Still at moderate level, but as I said, we had uh, enough room uh, to use this instrument. Another uh, uh, issue what we have learned is that we need to strengthen our public uh, finance management system, especially social protection system. So what I think uh, IMF's policy advice uh, should focus on short-term policy advice, policy advice on short-term recovery. Uh, we, I, I assume that all the countries have this dilemma that in the, this post-COVID era, we still have this post-crisis period when we should support still economy. Uh, we should support the people. Obviously, uh, the ultimate goal is to improve the uh, the healthcare situation uh, to save the lives, but it is, at the same time, in long run, we should focus on the fiscal sustainability. So this policy advice, how in short term, let us countries to focus on these short term policy goals, which are which are very important, and nobody can uh, assume that they can starting from this year uh, suddenly to sharply decrease their expenditure and deficits, but at the same time. Uh, keep in mind how to uh, keep uh, financial sustainability, fiscal sustainability in the long run. Uh, what I think is that uh, we, it will be very important uh, to help us to, to fight this balance between this, these two issues. Another is that uh, to support countries to improve governance and transparency, for example, in public procurement system. For example, in our case, uh, we have started to improve uh, transparency in public management, in public finance management, especially in public procurement system, we had a lot of steps 
but what is next? It's not just about the publishing all the data, but how to make this transparency really lead to efficiency of the usage of the public finance. Because given this situation, uh, given the uh, restrictions in the future, uh, borrowings, uh, uh, I think that it, it becomes very important to make sure that the existing money, existing financial resources uh, would be, uh, will be uh, used in a more efficient way. So here the IMF could help uh, with the capacity building program as usual, because uh, the quality of the policy decision is always depend on the quality of the staff, uh, quality of the statistics and the technical analysis. And lastly, if uh, countries in the region uh, uh, want to keep the sustainable growth, it, it, we have to boost uh, the structural reforms. And in this area, I think the IMF and other IFI assistance uh, can be vital in providing advice on the right sequencing of this reform in this uh, current difficult situation. Now we have less probably uh, fiscal space to do some steps which we planned before. And we had some areas, some sectors of economy who are adversely affected by the crisis. So this right sequencing in which area we should start with uh, structural reforms, maybe the way we have to change our plans. I think it's uh, very important and IMF advice would be very useful, I think. Thank you. Very, very interesting. And let's hear an outside voice and turn to Mr. Peter Burian. Uh, Mr. Burian, countries in the region have strived to strengthen their integration into the global economy. In your view, what is holding the region's markets from being more integrated into the global economic and financial system? And what reforms would you recommend to make the region more attractive for foreign capital? Yeah. Okay. Um... Thank you, Nastasia. It's a great pleasure for me to participate in this very timely and important discussion and share some views on uh, uh, very urgent topics. And as you know, uh, the EU is a very strong supporter of uh, regional integration and uh, cooperation as really uh, something which is very important for the region to, to benefit from its uh, strategic location. But I have to say that in spite of some progress in the regional integration and also efforts of governments to improve conditions for trade and business activities, the region, Central Asia, remains still one of the least integrated and uh, connected regions. And this uh, situation, in my view, prevents the region to fully benefit from its strategic uh, location position as a link uh, uh, or a gateway between Europe and Asia in all directions, not only east-west, but also uh, north-south. And this situation also prevents the predominantly young population in all five countries to find jobs in their home countries and look for job opportunities elsewhere. And I believe uh, some of the reason might be hidden uh, in the fact that for too many years, countries of the region were relying in their economic growth on exceptionally high commodity prices, export of minerals or revenues from remittances of labor migrants, mostly working in Russia. And also they delayed important structural reforms which would strengthen the diversification of their economies and address increase of their resilience to external and internal shocks as we are witnessing today due to the implication of COVID-19 pandemic. And now I see uh, and I'm pleased to know that most of the countries realize that uh, business as usual is not an option and it's not sustainable. And I'm pleased to see that uh, this understanding has uh, been already reflected in ambition reform packages adopted by Uzbekistan. And I was pleased that this was confirmed also by uh, um, Minister from Uzbekistan and also Kazakhstan, but also uh, I believe other countries really now are trying to um, pursue their uh, uh, efforts and, and uh, do uh, things in a more sustainable way and uh, pursue reforms. And uh, the problem uh, is a slow progress in the implementation of reforms, uh, re reforms, which is also connected with lack of administrative, human and financial resources 
or sometimes wasteful uh, use of resources for projects lacking economic viability and environmental sustainability. And last but not least, a lot of resources is absorbed by corruption. Uh, we believe uh, that if the region wants to become more resilient, prosperous, and more attractive for investor, uh, investors, it needs to speed up structural reforms that would change the fabric of their economies and improve regulatory framework in which business and people operate. And I see three um, essential areas of reforms and measures which need to be pursued without delay and translated into concrete practical steps for strength and competitiveness, diversification, connectivity and attractiveness for investors. First of all, it's an improvement in public governance, including also management of public finances in a more transparent and accountable manner. And uh, governance means also involvement of people, uh, civil society in shaping uh, approaches, uh, providing feedback uh, for governments. And last but not least, uh, governments means also access to justice, and also other elements which uh, are very important for uh, uh, conflict resolution and uh, problem uh, solving, uh, whether they are formal or informal. Second, I mentioned the connectivity. Uh, we believe uh, the region needs to pursue uh, rules-based sustainable connectivity uh, to be connected to uh, larger markets uh, around um, Central Asia. And uh, there are many important markets, but still the infrastructure, but also rules are not sufficiently uh, addressing uh, this, this uh, challenge. Third, enhance business environment based on inter, uh, internationally recognized standards, including zero tolerance for corruption, which I already mentioned. And in general, uh, there is a need to develop governance and economic models that are less centralized and more responsive to the needs of a wide range of interests and sectors. Finally, there is a need to reform uh, their education systems uh, focus on building skills from early age and training specialists for key sectors and digitalization of education and access to most advanced knowledge is key uh, to this end, I believe. I think it's very important to mention in this regard because both ministers mentioned it. Um, uh, uh, I, I wanted to reassure our partners that they are not alone in this process and we have really developed many mechanisms for bilateral and uh, regional cooperation uh, for addressing those challenges and also uh, benefiting from our integration experience and also building single market connectivity uh, through our uh, transport networks and, and so on. So these uh, experiences are available and uh, we believe uh, that um, uh, our partners should, should uh, benefit more uh, from, from those programs like uh, um, Ready for Trade, Switch Asia, Central Asia, Invest Rule of Law in Central Asia, addressing those three elements which I mentioned, these three key uh, reform areas. And there are, uh, it's important to say, implemented also through our money by other partners like OECD, EBR, the Council of Europe, which have undeniable uh, uh, experience and expertise. And um, it's very important that also countries further uh, pursue integration into um, um, structures like WTO. And I'm pleased to see that uh, two remaining countries now are speeding up this process, Uzbekistan um, could benefit also from our uh, package of support for integration and also for uh, adjusting um, internally for the accession to uh, WTO and Turkmenistan becoming an observer. Uh, um, uh, I, I believe uh, will will proceed also quickly for a full integration uh, into WTO, which. Uh, of course, implies a harmonization of customs regulation, standards, certification. But what is uh, very important, it helps trade policies to be more open and predictable and economies and countries more attractive uh, 
for um, investors. And final point, we want to further expand our, our cooperation and support for trade and integration in Central Asia by creating a new platform for our inter-regional dialogue. We call it EU Central Asia Economic Forum, which will be held hopefully this year in uh, autumn in person in Bishkek. And we already had the first online economic forum, which identified three key uh, priorities. Uh, first of all, it's support for transition to green economies, second, digitalization, and once again, uh, support for improving business environment. So I wanted to confirm that EU is fully ready to support this integration and regional cooperation efforts of our partners and uh, the, uh, the, the results, the, the uh, outcome, I believe is in their hands and I believe a uh, region could acquire this very important and deserved position in uh, global and regional uh, trade and uh, connectivity this way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burian. Uh, I'm sure your advice will be well heard in all the countries of the region. Uh, we've talked a lot about the challenges facing the region. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the opportunities and policy priorities. And I will turn the screen back to Mr. Shmedov, um, Finance Minister of Uzbekistan. What do you, Mr. Shmedov, see as policy priorities as the Caucasus and Central Asia policymakers focus on building more inclusive and product productive economies following the recovery? Uh, what do you see as the one or two most important structural reform priorities across the countries in the region? Uh, well, thank you. Well, first of all, uh, again, we should acknowledge uh, differences in, in the countries. Uh, but I think in many countries uh, in the region, we have uh, one common uh, issue is that uh, state has a large role in the economy. So that's why I think the first, uh, in our, in, the, in my view, uh, priority should be is uh, we should focus uh, to continue to build uh, market economies led by the private sector. Uh, Uzbekistan has a little bit uh, lag in this issue comparing with other emerging countries. Uh, but uh, several, uh, four years ago, uh, we have started these structural reforms and we are keen to continue in this way. Uh, second, uh, is that issue is that human capital is uh, as usual is very key for the long-term growth and uh, this pandemic hit uh, hard uh, the human capital and we should uh, protect it through improving our so social uh, safety nets uh, right uh, since the good uh, good health and education uh, system contribute uh, to the better quality uh, and to boost productivity i think this so Looks like we lost Mr. Shmedev for a little bit. Mr. Shmedev, are you there? Maybe as Mr. Shmedev reconnects, I'll pass the floor to Mrs. Natya Tornava for a couple minutes with the following question. Mrs. Tornava, during the pandemic, we have seen digitalization play an important role in facilitating work from home and in improving social safety nets. What reforms or investment priorities should the Caucasus and Central Asia countries pursue to ensure that the benefits of digitalization are widely shared? What do you think? Uh, well, uh, technological uh, advances and um, innovation um, generally play a key role in mitigating the negative impact of the pandemic and uh, in different sectors, uh, ranging from healthcare and telecommunications to agriculture can leverage technology to make a positive impact in society. Uh, digital technologies uh, provide uh, new opportunities, of course, associated with uh, uh, automation process, remote working, more efficient use of resources, uh, which in turn will increase competitiveness of private sector. And this is the case when we can say that the challenge could be turned to opportunity. Uh, therefore, the usage of modern technologies and uh, services have become an integral part of daily life of the community and uh, entrepreneurs. 
Uh, as part of our development agenda, we have strengthened our support dedicated to innovations and technologies and the development of broadband infrastructure, uh, as it uh, represents the prerequisite for development of digital economy in the country and uh, will ensure swift recovery. I think that technological advances, innovations, and human capital development uh, play a key role in mitigating the negative impact of pandemic as a COVID-19 crisis underscores the critical need for investment in digital skills in uh, vocational education and R&D activities. Uh, bridging down a digital divide gap is one of the main challenges worldwide. And Georgia is not an exception. Uh, we are strengthening uh, efforts to uh, support uh, business and communities uh, that have been impacted by uh, the pandemic. And uh, in this process, uh, we are putting a special emphasis uh, on the measures that provide uh, broadband infrastructure for areas without internet access. We still have such areas, especially in high mountain, uh, remote villages. Uh, the Login Georgia project supported by World Bank uh, will support to increase the coverage of high-speed broadband internet services in rural settlements and will boost the use of digitally enabled services through training and capacity building programs across the country and uh, uh, it helped us to promote the development of digital uh, financial services and e-commerce as well as online e-government services, which is very important in general for increase of uh, our uh, efficiency, um, but at the same time uh, to develop the services in a more safe, safe, epidemiologically safe way because uh, remote working is a still uh, very important in order to prevent the next outbreak of uh, pandemic. Under the framework to support the development of digital services and capabilities, one of the instruments represents broadband for development program implemented within the framework of JNE project, which uh, provides the internet vouchers for households and uh, MSMEs in rural areas to ensure the network readiness. And on the other hand, the program provides the e-commerce training for MSMEs, uh, supporting local business to upgrade their approaches in digital space and uh, supporting them to overcome uh, COVID-19 related challenges. Uh, let me mention that government of Georgia has uh, prioritized uh, developing knowledge-based and innovation-driven economy and institutionalized support in this regard. For the promotion and uh, commercialization of innovation and support of uh, transforming new creative ideas into businesses, a number of programs are being implemented, including uh, increased access to finance opportunities for individuals, for scientists, for innovators, startups, and SMEs by elaborating financial support and technology transfer mechanism, the special mechanism which is dedicated to these particular groups. Uh, Georgia has potential to take advantage of its geographic location and attractive business environment and become a regional digital hub, which will help to address challenges related to limited uh, international data connectivity, uh, as it was mentioned by the previous speakers, and uh, to, to address the challenge related to development of domestic IT capabilities. Uh, in this regard, government of Georgia explores uh, the possibility to attract investments in uh, the development of uh, digital corridor uh, and data centers, which could serve as a regional hub for South uh, Caucasus and the gateway of the EU and Asia. So here we would like also to capitalize more on our favorable geopolitical location. Uh, that's all briefly I wanted to say uh, to this question. Thank you, Mrs. Minister. Um, please, for the next round of questions, I'd have to ask the speakers to keep the answers short in the interest of time. Uh, Mr. Burian, a question for you. Uh, the recovery is subject to large uncertainty and risks, especially in countries where weak macroeconomic fundamentals limit the capacity to address crisis legacies, such as increased poverty and inequality or economic scarring. In this context, what reforms could be prioritized now by the Caucasus and Central Asia countries to permit a smoother reallocation of resources such as labor or capital and limit that scarring? What do you think?
Mr. Burian, you're on mute. I apologize. Yeah. No uh, uh, thank you for the, for the question, and uh, uh, I, I uh, share the opinion of previous speakers uh, uh, and their observation that COVID nineteen uh, pandemic and its implications uh, represent an unprecedented shock uh, for the region, for individual countries, and potential scaring effects uh, are still difficult to to uh, predict. Um, uh, it's, of course, very natural that immediate responses should be directed to saving lives, and we very much appreciate uh, uh, quite decisive measures of our partners in Central Asia and other countries. Uh, also focus on uh, most vulnerable groups, youth, women, persons with disabilities. And in this regard, I wanted to also share uh, the information that EU uh, provided 100 million euro for helping our partners addressing uh, immediate consequences of the pandemic by relocating uh, funds from other uh, programs, uh, regional and, and bilateral. But at the same time, we believe that the current crisis, as is, it was mentioned by Minister Turnava, uh, uh, offers an opportunity to do things uh, differently, to build forward better and greener. And that, that is why uh, we want to promote uh, together with our partners, uh, a green people-centered uh, recovery from the crisis, which would not only allow to pursue environment, environmentally and economically sustainable and inclusive solutions, leaving no one behind, but also make the region more prosperous, prosperous and resilient against future external uh, and internal shocks. And I'm pleased to see that our partners see in the EU a strong and reliable partner for this kind of recovery. They understand the value of this kind of approach. And uh, we see that uh, they also uh, understand that there is no room for delaying. Uh, measures, including uh, uh, mitigating the impact of climate change, uh, which uh, is growing in the region, and uh, there are urgent adaptation and mitigation measures needed uh, to address these challenges, challenges in a comprehensive manner without delay. Um, uh, I believe um, uh, the, the pandemic should not be uh, delaying uh, um, this uh, cooperation and efforts. Um, we need to, uh, even with a bigger vigor, uh, vigor uh, to, to address uh, the impact of climate change. And there is also no sense uh, to further invest into certain outdated uh, technologies, including coal firing technologies, infrastructure and industries, which create more harm to environment and might exacerbate or even accelerate the impact of climate change in the region. Uh, having said that, we still see that uh, um, um, for uh, addressing immediate needs uh, for uh, energy and so on, still uh, countries are tempted to, to invest, to refurbishing these kind of outdated uh, uh, power stations and so on. Uh, but once again, uh, we uh, hope that uh, that they will understand that uh, uh, we need to move very quickly uh, uh, with transition to green uh, circular economy, reform water sector, energy sector. And uh, we know it from our own experience that bringing down em emissions uh, doesn't need to happen at the expense of economic uh, growth. And in this res respect uh, and regard, we believe uh, that proper policy responses are needed. Um, I mentioned one of them, strengthening core elements of green and inclusive uh, economy, uh, investing into uh, renewables, hydro, solar, wind um, sources of energy, sustainable management of natural resources, and also investing in green agri-sector transformation, increasing food security and decreasing environmental impacts uh, through water sector reform. Second, uh, it was mentioned also by previous speakers, investing in human development, including reforms of health and education systems. Uh, it, uh, it really is an urgent uh, matter and uh, money cannot be saved by uh, not investing enough into education of young people. Third, digitalization, 
Um, but here we need to be sure that we avoid digital gaps and divides, providing better services to all segments of the population, including in the area of education. And fourth one, I already alluded to strengthening regional cooperation in addressing existing challenges together, and we see positive uh, developments there. And last point, uh, we believe all of the government and whole of society approaches are key elements of success to this end, involving women and youth as change makers into shaping strategies for recovery, reflecting their unique perspectives and needs. And we promote these approaches also through our EU Central Asia Civil Society Forum, which facilitates uh, involvement of women, youth, researchers, civil society in general, in modernization and transformation processes in Central Asia. Thank you very much. Very important advice as always, Mr. Burian. Now let's round it up and go back to the IMF, Mr. Subirlal. The IMF has championed an inclusive growth agenda for the region in recent years. As countries look beyond the immediate recovery, what new opportunities should policymakers keep in mind to better promote this agenda in the future? Um, thank you, Nastasia. Um, uh, since uh, the distinguished ministers and Ambassador Burian have, have made quite a few important points, maybe I can uh, try to be brief and just put it in, in terms of the, in the framework and how we look at inclusive growth in the region. Of course, um, you know, inequality and poverty have been longstanding challenges in many countries in the region, and crises are never good for uh, these uh, improving improvements in these factors. In fact, uh, the danger is that once poverty and inequality rises in a crisis, we go on to a new trajectory, which is worse than even the baseline before the crisis. But the challenge for the countries is not just get, getting back to the previous baseline, but in fact, improving on that. And that's what we are trying to uh, focus on in our inclusive growth agenda. Uh, which is uh, how do you improve the long-term trajectory in terms of uh, raising living standards for all and making sure that uh, no one is left behind. Now, of course, uh, higher growth is an essential uh, component of that, but it's necessary but not sufficient. Uh, so when focusing on that, and I think, um, yeah, the you know, uh, for instance, Minister uh, Ishmet of uh, um, touched on the topic, the footprint of the state in, in most of the countries in the region needs to be reduced. Because we know uh, the evidence worldwide, in fact, and including in advanced economies has shown that most jobs uh, get created. And obviously creating jobs and high paying jobs is the way to reduce poverty in the long term, uh, along with the social safety system, of course, but creating jobs and creating well paying jobs is the best way to uh, uh, reduce poverty and reduce inequality. But that has to be led by the private sector. Um, we have been discussing this morning how fiscal space is constrained in a number of countries. And so, uh, in fact, what the state needs to do is reorient itself in many countries and modernize. And the role of the state then is as an enabler and a facilitator for the private sector to create jobs and you know, um, in fact, uh, Nastasia, you may be aware of this uh, fact that most of jobs worldwide are created by small firms and when these small firms grow bigger. Uh, and so that's the challenge is to create a level playing field that encourages the reallocation of labor and capital uh, for the creation uh, of new companies and new jobs. And of course, this means, uh, what does reducing the footprint of the state mean? There are some things that the state only can provide, and that's in terms of public goods. We talked about education. Minister Tarnava also talked about training and skills, for example. That's a very important thing that only the state can do. Public infrastructure is also uh, where there's a role for the state. Good governance that Ambassador uh, Burian mentioned just now is, is, is the role of the state and, uh, and transparency and governance. Uh, uh, which also Minister Hishmet have uh, talked about. So those there are there is a role for the state in a modern economy, and without a well-functioning modernized state role, the private sector cannot thrive. And so that's important. But for the private sector's point of view, you know, labor market uh, reforms are going to be on training uh, for workers. Digitalization will help improve the skills. 
And SOE reform, it's very important for a number of countries because a heavy footprint of the state-owned enterprise sector can crowd out the private sector. For example, just as an illustration, if there's a significant wage gap between the SOE sector uh, and the private sector, it'll be very difficult for new startup companies to attract workers because they can uh, get a better paying job for life in a state-owned company. And of course, uh, there are other Im important elements of this. When I talk about the role of the state and when we talk about inclusive growth, we also do need to talk about climate resilient infrastructure because ultimately shocks hurt everybody. And so the role of the state is also important to promote this kind of climate resilient infrastructure and promoting regional cooperation and um, uh, connectivity and, and some of the other things uh, such as opening up to trade. But the broad framework is, if I can summarize in two sentences, private sector led a level playing field, good competition, uh, 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 a playground for competition and, and fair competition and the role of the state as a modern enabler, not as a gatekeeper. Let me stop here, Anastasia. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Lal. Um, now we are lucky to benefit from the view by the EBRD today, and we have Alain Pilou with us, Vice President at the EBRD. Uh, Mr. Pilou, uh, what do you? What's your perspective on today's discussion? A few words in a nutshell. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, dear Subir and uh, and Nastasia for uh, for having me. My video keeps disappearing, but Nastasia, uh, I'm sure will uh, will handle that. Look, first of all, for, for us, the, the regions which are the subject of the debate today are very important. Uh, one, in terms of investment, uh, we invested $1.5 billion in Central Asia last year and $1 billion in the Caucasus uh, countries. And by the way, uh, dear colleagues, the top two were Georgia and Uzbekistan, by, <laughs> by coincidence, with the friends on screen today. And it is also a very important region in terms of policy engagement of course, uh, in close coordination with our partners, in particular uh, the IMF and uh, the European uh, Union. I will limit my comments to, to four small uh, observations. Uh, first of all, I would like to draw uh, the attention of all to the banking sector, in particular in uh, Central Asia, because it is a sector critical to recovery. Uh, banks in the region uh, have entered the pandemic with reasonable buffers, but, and in particular in Central Asia, the true extent of the non-performing loans is yet to be understood. And I am sure the colleagues will agree that careful monitoring would be required, uh, will be required going, uh, go going forward. And as far as we are concerned, of course, we stand ready with others to uh, support uh, that effort. My second comment is, uh, as many colleagues uh, said uh, already, is that every cloud uh, has a silver lining, as they say in English, and this pandemic is an incentive to speed up reform and to build uh, back uh, better economies, at, as, as Peter uh, said. We are very encouraged to see that Uzbekistan appears to be keen to accelerate the process of privatizing key state-owned banks and key state-owned enterprises, and recently adopted our recommendations, by the way, on state ownership, state asset management, and privatization. Encouraged as well that Kazakhstan created a new body to coordinate and inject new ideas into the reform uh, process. And I am sure, Natia, that Georgia will remain the uh, leader of the second wave of reform. You know, this is the way we dubbed you, and, uh, and we hope very much that you will hold the fort and uh, and continue, you know, to uh, uphold, you know, this uh, this uh, this qualification. Um, the uh, third remark is that, of course, uh, apart from uh, speeding up uh, ongoing reforms aimed to improve governance and institutions and uh, level level playing field, as uh, as Subir uh, said in his uh, in in his wrap up. It is also important to address a fundamental uh, area for recovery, which is the investment in infrastructure. And as you know, in particular in Central Asia, a number of countries have reached critical level of indebtedness, such as Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And while at the same time facing very high needs 
in additional infrastructure and additional social spending. And uh, other countries have also you know, similar problem, even if they are not uh, as acute as in these low income countries. It will be very important in our view to develop the presence of the private sector in infrastructure to stimulate the presence of the private sector in infrastructure, ports, airports, uh, uh, railway rolling carts, energy production. You, you know the example of Bakad in Kazakhstan, the ring road around Almaty, which has been uh, done on a, on a PPP basis. This is extremely important because it is a, a way out of the impasse in public spending in many countries. And I am pretty sure that Subir, I see that he's nodding, will, uh, will certainly uh, support this statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. And of course, uh, we at EBRD are always committed to help you uh, build back uh, better. And this year, our products will be skewed more to crisis recovery than to, than to crisis response, as was the case uh, last year. Thank you very much again. Great. Thank you, Monsieur Pelou. Uh, we'll open the floor to questions. I remind the audience that you can ask questions in the chat box on Zoom, as well as on social media using hashtag CCA. And we already have a couple. The first question I think should go to Mr. Um, Mr. Lal. I'll read it out for you. It's from the Zoom audience. Um, the IMF advises many countries to privatize various industries, for example, hospitals, kindergartens, schools, etc. Will privatization help to grow the economy in Central Asia? How do you ensure privatization's benefits are shared widespread and not just amongst the elites? Um, thank you very much for the question. And um, thank you, Nastasia, as well. Uh, as uh, I was uh, mentioning in my remarks earlier, and I think also I'm happy to hear from Alain as well on this. It's, it, the question is not about privatization. The question is, is a more fundamental one about what is the role of the state and what is the role of the private sector? Um, so there are some things that, as I mentioned earlier, only the state can do, and that is the provision of public goods. And, but there are other things that the private sector can do. Um, now, in, in, of course, uh, circumstances vary and specifics vary, but in general, health and education are public goods, and the state is often best placed uh, to provide that. That does not mean that there is no room for the private sector in also helping and working alongside the state in the provision of these services and facilities. But to come to the second part of the question, what is important is, I mean, you know, privatization or private ownership is not a magic bullet or a solution to all of life's problems. It has to be within a framework that guarantees that just as with the state, there is transparency. As I mentioned, there should be competition so that we don't have what is called rent seeking in the private sector. And, and so that there is free entry and exit and, uh, and people and shareholders, for instance, understand how resources are being used. So I think I would summarize it by saying that there is a role for the state and there is a role for the private sector and even the private sector needs to operate within uh, uh, a level playing field and with transparency and within enforcement of competition rules. I mean, just to give an example, of course, if, if you think of a monopoly, that is not necessarily a good thing. It might be privately held, but it may not be one that encourages further investment into a sector or more job creation. So that's why, um, you know, uh, the devil is always in the details and there's not a single answer, but I hope this provides a framework into the way we think about this issue. Thank you and over to you, Nastasia. Thank you, Mr. Lal. Our second question is for panelists, but maybe you can as well address it. Uh, how can the oil dependent countries of the region invest more in greener and inclusive growth? I would like to hear from Mr. Shmedev. Welcome back, you're back online. And then maybe from Mr. Lal as well. Thank you very much, Nastasia. Well, actually, I think uh, to focus on a green economy creates a very good opportunity given the 
technological changes in the last decade or even two decades helps actually uh, in, in the current stage uh, to countries with abundant natural resources, let's say like Uzbekistan, uh, to make sure that they can use those resources in a more efficient way, which will lead to more kind of inclusive growth. And this is what we have started actually a couple of years ago. We even adopted our strategy uh, to move to the green economy over the next uh, 10 years. And this is uh, one of the opportunities where uh, we can probably leap, leapfrog and in some areas somehow to catch up in, in the reforms and uh, uh, in, the, in the economic development uh, with other uh, emerging economies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowell. Do you have something yes. to add? So very briefly, uh, maybe, um, uh, I think this is an important question and, and to put it again in the context, um, you know, the, the IMF uh, and our department put out a paper about a year ago uh, on, on the future of oil. And in fact, uh, one of the key takeaways, and I would encourage the audience to look at that paper, what it says is that the oil demand is likely to peak and decline within a foreseeable future, not that far off in the future. And in fact, the demand for oil, for instance, will uh, drop off um, well before the supply of oil runs out. So it is in fact important for everybody, um, oil producers, but uh, also others to think about a post uh, hydrocarbon economy. We have seen that um, uh, it is uh, also good business to be climate resilient and building back a theme that has been uh, talked about this morning uh, in a way that is uh, resilient um, uh, and uh, in the way that uh, pays attention to the green economy is going to be very important and it is money well spent, including by the state. Uh, I won't repeat, but I obviously agree with the points made by Minister Ishmata, which is that, you know, one uh, can leapfrog in terms of technologies, in terms of adaptation, but also the state can play a role in leading by example in switching to more uh, uh, environmentally friendly technologies as well. Uh, one example uh, of uh, an area where, in fact, uh, adapting to a more green economy uh, is uh, quite striking is, is the cost of solar power, for example, and uh, even wind power. Uh, I mean, the price has plummeted dramatically and now the big race is on in terms of storage capacity. So there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of um, exciting things going on and the cost is not um, as prohibitive as it used to be. So this is a great opportunity if you are going to spend money now in building back and if you're going to um, uh, spend money in ensuring an inclusive, uh, inclusive growth for the economy, where would you want to spend it? It makes sense to take a long-term view and spend it in, in a way that makes the economy uh, more green. And so that would be you know, the, the broad takeaway from what the, the opportunity that comes from the current crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Law. Uh, certainly oil versus green recovery, green economy is a hot topic these days, but also uh, an important topic that we haven't mentioned yet is the effect on uh, women and youth that the pandemic had. And uh, in this regard, I have a question for Mrs. Tornava, if I may. In many countries, the crisis has had a disproportionate effect on women and youth, including through their participation in the labor market. In what ways can policymakers empower youth and women so that they can actively become engines of growth and change going forward? Uh, uh, thank you for uh, this question. Uh, indeed, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, had a kind of asymmetric impact of uh, different social groups. And as a result of pandemic, youth, uh, women, and relatively low skilled labor have been uh, hit the hardest. Uh, in this regard, uh, let me briefly touch upon the importance of uh, education. Once again, I'd like to reiterate how important education is and human capital development in general, which is a prerequisite for inclusive and uh, sustainable economic growth. Uh, education uh, reform is the cornerstone of our long-run economic policy. 
which uh, through the inclusive access to the economic opportunities will contribute to the well-being of the country and the eradication of poverty in the medium, medium run. Uh, the human capital development uh, represents the crucial aspect for the reduction of skills gap and for the improving business sector competitiveness. Uh, in order to ensure better alignment with the skills demanded in the labor market, uh, we are strengthening our efforts to monitor labor market needs uh, uh, and uh, to monitor private sector demand in this regard and to conduct labor market analysis um, and uh, job diagnostic because without precise diagnostic we cannot uh, take some policy actions. Besides, we fully recognize benefits of uh, women empowerment for economic growth and development and uh, seek to improve our policies in this respect in order to ensure uh, equitable opportunities for men and uh, women. Uh, Georgia has a significant capacity to uh, maximize, uh, uh, maximize utilization of labor resources and uh, to accelerate economic growth by promoting women and youth engagement uh, uh, and participation in labor force and uh, economic activities. Uh, improving uh, prospects for young people and uh, creating solid background for women empowerment is uh, at the heart of uh, Georgia's economic policy and uh, I myself am very much uh, in favor of uh, strengthening of women's uh, women presence and uh, high level positions, senior positions. Um, uh, so uh, we have uh, prioritized uh, uh, women involvement in entrepreneurship also in our state support programs. Uh, uh, at the same time, we're putting efforts to support uh, uh, innovations, development of innovation ecosystem, R&D commercialization and startups. This, this in turn will uh, positively affect the opportunities for use and uh, the inclusive access to the economic opportunities. Uh, let me mention that various programs are being elaborated to leverage the existing uh, talent pools Georgia is having, especially in IT system, uh, improving education and uh, vocational uh, trainings remains key to increase skills of the labor force in general uh, and expanding education in science and technology and uh, mobilizing investments in R&D activities will support uh, productivity enhancement and broad-based economic growth. And in this uh, regard, we have uh, prioritized the professional, uh, scientific, technical and research activities and knowledge-based services in our FDI uh, attraction strategy as well. And of course, uh, it uh, helps to promote more um, uh, use related activities and more involvement of young, talented people in uh, uh, development of our economy. Thank you, Mrs. Turnava. As our time is running out, I would like to address each panelist for one sentence of your takeaways from today's excellent discussion, please. Who would like to start? Mr. Lal. Uh, no, Ambassador Borin, please. Okay, Ambassador Borin. Yeah, it's a challenge uh, to, to express uh, in one sentence, but I think inclusive green uh, economic uh, reco uh, and, and social recovery uh, is a way uh, out from the current crisis. So I would put it this way. Okay, thank you. Perhaps Mr. I can add one sentence, thank you. Uh, Compared to the last time, what I would say is we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel and there's reason for us to be optimistic about the outlook and the future for countries in the CCA. And we should take advantage of the opportunity to build forward better and in a way that uh, reduces poverty and inequality. It's a long sentence, but it's still one sentence. Thank you. Yes, it works. Ministers? Minister Shmatov, yes. Yeah, let me try. Well, I think this uh, COVID has taught us again that human capital is uh, vital and very important. And we have never forget uh, about the so social safety nets. Uh, and uh, 
always keep in mind that the fiscal prudence uh, always helps in the bad times. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I would like also to, to join my colleagues in underlining uh, of importance of green and inclusive recovery, which is uh, very important in these times to be focused on. Of course, uh, digitalization and innovation, because uh, the crisis forced us to be more proactive and more uh, creative, and the uh, importance of uh, coordinated efforts, because we should uh, meet the crisis and challenges all together. We cannot overcome the crisis and challenge in a standalone single country. So let us act together uh, in coordination and uh, to support each other. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Monsieur Pelou would like to say a word as well. Okay, thank you for unmuting me. Actually, I will elaborate on what Natia said, uh, the uh, extreme importance to work together, to be joined at the hip, governments, uh, international institutions, civil society, in order to get out of this crisis in a better shape and to accelerate reform. Thank you, all very clear. If I could wrap up today's um, very interesting discussion, we've heard a lot of the words of integration, coordination, togetherness, inclusiveness, which means we should probably work together We've heard about um, working on labor force, on uh, well-targeted state policies, on improving productivity, and a lot of words, green, green economy, green energy, green everything. So those words in a nutshell, I, I think form our direction and the direction of the region going forward until probably the IMF's next presentation on the outlook on the region. It was a formidable discussion and I thank all the panelists and everybody who could join us via any medium you chose. And please join us again, it was a pleasure. Thank you.